Podcast One presents the Steve Austin Show Classics. I'm sitting here at the Gold Burst Garage. There's a sign in the corner that says that. Let's move over here, Bill. I want to talk to you about a few automobiles in your possession. We're walking Throwing and my talking. wife's possession. We're walking and talking right now. When we're in the, uh, what would this be, the, the southern wing, the eastern wing? I don't know, man. I, I've been hitting the head too many times to know what direction I'm pointing in. So but check it out. This is, the, this is the upper level. Hey, before we start talking about these automobiles, I left the fans last week hanging on a cliffhanger. You said it just wasn't fun for you anymore, and it, you were... Elements of it what weren't fun for me anymore. See, every time I, I make a comment, I have to backtrack and understand that people are going to take certain elements of it the wrong way. So, you know, certain elements of it were negative. You know, the fans' reaction, the ability to pick guys up and smash them in the face without getting put in jail, that was awesome. Other things, interacting with wonderful superstars and idols of mine such as yourself. Um, he, he rolled his eyes, ladies and gentlemen. You motherfucker. <laughs> he rolled his eyes at a global icon See, of the, the good thing is, The good thing is that I do things to guys like you that, that most nobody would ever do. And that ev- evokes a, a humorous reaction from you. Therefore, I've succeeded. That's, See, that's, that's my, my angle. At the end of the WWE run, you came in there. Dude, it, it just didn't see. To me, it seemed like. Maybe, maybe the, the the run was shutting down, or was it a square peg in a round hole? It was a square peg in a round hole. I don't think that's what I thought. I, you know, I'm not going to speak for anybody on their end, but I don't think from the beginning that either one of us gave it a fair shot. I mean, I don't know. I, like I said, I, I mean, I had a predisposed idea of what I was going to encounter. Um, what was that predisposed idea? Negativity period end of story whatever it may be whether it be because of what i ask for because of what i say because of what i do because of what i don't do everything honestly i'm not trying to be vague everything i I never thought as though i always felt as though i was at a i was a football player at a frat party right that to me that's a pretty fair analogy what was the uh the difference in the vibe uh WCW to WWF. What was it WWF at the time? Well, I mean, I yeah. mean dude, I, I mean, remember I was in. I was. If you in, were the bad I guy was in w- Europe doing my book signing, and you guys were having the fight with the W with the right. World Wildlife Federation. So anyway, you you come in and it's like, uh, what was the difference in the locker room? Because if you were the bad guy back in the day when you got the monster push. Now you come in, and there's job security on the line for top guys because here comes Goldberg, and so some, some guys are going to per- perceive you as a threat. You and I have been friends for a long time. I just say, hey, man, here comes Goldberg. I don't know what's going to happen. Like I said earlier, I, I'm on a way out here pretty quick, so I was way cool with you coming in. But what did it feel like to, to you just on a personal level being in that different vibe? It was different, man. It's just, it, was, it was never like the football atmosphere, the football locker room where you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't. I mean, there are a lot of things that I could. You weren't at home. You weren't, you weren't at home. No, man. Because that's, when, why, that's why, you know, and because of maybe the – position that I was at that's why at times I had my own locker room and that was looked upon in a negative way but I always felt as though if you keep and I'm not trying to be a badass you know me dude okay I mean honestly but if you keep a if a caged animal if a fucking tyrannosaurus rex chooses to be in a room because he knows that the path of least resistance is much more favorable in everybody's outcome then so be it. What's wrong with that? You know, and it wasn't because I couldn't coexist with people. It wasn't because of this. It wasn't because it was just because, man, I, I came in, I did my job and I felt as though that if I contributed in that respect, um, I didn't have to go interact with this guy and that guy. And I just, I was trying to be business, man. And if people looked at that in a negative way, then I'm sorry, man. But it was something that I always looked at was always looked at in a negative way. But, I mean, I, 
Well, let me let me digress a little bit and backtrack. I'll never forget the times. There were wonderful, wonderful fucking times uh, in the wrestling business for me. The, one of the most wonderful was meeting you for the first time. Uh, I can't remember where it was, but I remember it was at the meal before the match, and I, uh, you know, it was it was. It was fucking cool, man. It was cool. I'd heard so much about you, and I'd, I'd seen so much about you. And obviously, we've always been compared against each other. But to to shake your hand and look you in the eyes and hear you talk to me and call me kid, and it was an honor, man. It was cool. It, it was really neat. Here's so, I mean, thing. times like that. And, and obviously, I'd known Taker for years prior to that. So, you know, times like th- there were some really cool times in the business. How, how d- d- we got to go back now because you got some old memories going. Uh, and dude, this is just you and me shooting the breeze in your garage. And you should have heard the conversation. We took a little beer break while ago. That's that's total kayfabe. We, we're keeping. <laughs> yeah. But dude, when you used to go through the airports and you would hear Stone Cold, hey Stone Cold Austin, me when I was walking through the airport. <laughs> Goldberg! What do you mean was? Goldberg. There's Goldberg. I think, hey, hey, Goldberg. I think it happened to me la- every time I go everywhere. But here's my question. I'm going a- no, go to cut you off with a question for yes, a question. You your what's, what's, your, what's, your, what's your top comeback? In one sentence, what's your top comeback? Or in one word, what's your top comeback? What do you do? What, don't say the feeling that, you evoke, that you evokes you. What do you say? I didn't say shit. Come on, man. I didn't say shit because, I mean, if, if I did, it had to be fuck you, but I, I just never registered. <laughs> if it did, I can't I, it have to be fuck you. Well, you know what mine was? What? I say he's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> you motherfucker. I'm just saying. I'm my glasses yeah, I'm on just the saying, table. man. I'm you, putting, hey, I we're being put, real. I got two pairs. I got a pair of sunglasses and eyeglasses on the table. I just put them on the table. Those are bifocals, man. Those All ain't right, fucking eyeglasses. Be a honest. rotator cuff. No, dude, it used to make me madder than a hornet because here's the deal. Dude, the competition, and we're friends, and I always respect I always him. looked at it as an honor. But what? I still tell people I'm you but, but because, here's the they, thing. because I'm so skinny now. But here's the thing. Well, I'm fat as fuck. i got to get back <laughs> in the gym. But here's the thing, dude. You, you were newer to the business, but it was straight up. It, the, the competition between the companies was a shoot. Dude, so for me to be dude, mistaken as Goldberg made me mad. Second by second. You guys used to do the same shit. Yeah, right? but, I mean, it, it just it, it angered me because, I mean, that, that, was, com- that was competition. I, Absolutely. I enjoyed. And here's the thing. You didn't get a chance to watch every single thing I did, nor did I get a chance to watch every single thing you did. Glimpses. Hey, dude, black truck, black truck. Dude, we, we, we look a lot. You're a little bit more jacked up than me, so I can understand why a wrestling fan who's flicking back and forth would get confused. But the competition was so heavy back in the day. Between the companies, that was a shoot. You and me put up and, with it. And it was ironic that, you know, two of the very top guys looked, you know, quite similar. It had, you know, look was completely i mean if you look closely we were completely different by we still are we always will be we're completely two different characters but at the at a casual glance yeah i could see the similarity but you know i'll be perfectly honest with you it fucking made me want to rip someone's head off when they ate goldberg i mean hey austin i was like you fuck you you know because you know, only because I'm, I was like 300, man, and I had fucking traps, and I was like, ah, all the time. And I'm like, fuck, what am I shrinking? So basically, that, that was the only fuck. thing. But other than that, other, other than, than physique wise, you're just shitting on me in your garage. I'm not shitting on you. I'm just saying the reality is, yeah. and this is how look I look at everything. What was the heaviest you were when you looked the best? Oh, uh, 255. Thank you. Yeah. That's reality. I was that's 300 I fucking pounds. So that's the only thing. Other than that was 1% of it. Other than that, the fact that anybody would think that I was somebody who was one of the most successful guys who ever fucking laced up the boots, it was a huge honor. But I couldn't acknowledge it and go, oh, God, thank you. I'm fucking Goldberg, bitch. I fucking eat Stone Cold. I can't go, you know, yeah, man, thank you very much. I really appreciate that, but I'm Goldberg, and, you know, I'm emasculated again. Fucking Goldberg has about, I don't know, 20 cars. There's enough for a 20 by 20 squared circle. There, we're, we're about to have a goddamn match. I'm going to go get some railroad ties, and we're going to make a ring. This is going to happen right here. It's going to be a shoot. I'm kidding. You're listening to another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. You own or rent your home? Sure you do, and I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. 
GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. When people mention the name Stone Cold Steve Austin, or when people would see Stone Cold Steve Austin, uh, or if you say The Rock, or if you say The Undertaker, you know who and what they are from a gimmick per, uh, perspective or their persona that they played in the ring. Stone Cold is me turned up all the way to 12. And so it was, uh, hey, fuck you, a beer-drinking guy. He's pissed off at the system. He's going to raise hell. If you fuck with him, he's going to kick your ass. You knew what Stone and it was beer and middle fingers. So that was kind of the, the long story short definition of my character and, and there was much more depth to it than that but just on the surface that's what you think you're always seeing a, a hell raising badass redneck kind of guy is going to beat your ass if you piss him off when you say when you say goldberg i mean because dude you were so over and i want to get to your entrance in a minute but how would you define the goldberg persona slash gimmick because i was a hell raiser you would be the what we're talking uh, shop. In the days of old when you used to throw people to the lions, I was the lion. Uh, in the days when, from the inception of professional wrestling, when the word gimmick has always been looked upon as a definition of a wrestler or a character, there has been, from time to time, I'm so eloquent at times, there's been from time to time people that are far from reality in that they are quite ridiculous. I was the fucking opposite of that in that I wasn't there to impress you with my moves. I was there to say, I saw you walk into that restaurant and there was a 75 year old woman that walked behind you and you didn't think enough to turn behind you and, and open the door for her. And she couldn't see, and she didn't understand that the door wasn't open, and she ran into it, fell down, and broke her ankle, and now she's on her way to the hospital. I'm here to fucking make sure that you don't ever do that again. That was me. Um, but after I show you that, teach you that lesson, I can step out of the ring, take a deep breath, and grab someone's baby and take a wonderful picture with them and have them not think that I'm going to eat them. You know, um, I was, I was the, I could be the, I was the person who could be the most unforgiving. I was, I was, uh, Brody in a completely different, I was Brody and, uh, what's his name from WCW, uh, Nikita Koloff. Okay. I was, I was, I was Hawk. I was Nikita, but I was. I was a football player, and I was, I don't know. Those are, the only, those are the two that I could compare myself to more than anyone, though it be the look and the way that they performed in the ring the, with their mentality as far as attacking an opponent. But I had remorse in uh, – no, I didn't have remorse. If you fucking if – you, if you cross me, then I was going to eat you. If you were an ally in any way, shape, or form, I would put my life on the line for you um i was the eternal good guy you know if anybody needed help i was there to help them uh question you never turned heel did you i did man i mean that's a whole nother podcast but i did but that's a whole nother story didn't work for you did it i did i i, I always told you i always told everybody and i told you earlier that i'm a performer i'm a i'm not an entertainer okay i'm not a booker I don't know what's right. I know that if you give me something, I can make it badass. I can't write the whole story because I don't that. It's not that I'm creative enough. It's it's that I probably am not. I'm not. Uh, no, let, let, let me. I, th I think I can interject here. I mean, like you, you're friends with Kevin Nash, as am I. Kevin Nash, he's a big pitcher mm -hmm. and he can book. Completely different. Me, I'm a salt pepper guy. If you give me an idea, I can make it better by Absolutely. putting salt, pepper, spices. So I'm not a big picture guy. Yeah. But if you give me a situation, I can go with it and then make it better. Exactly. And I can make it as. So what happened with the Hill Run? Well, 
the kids, man. The kids. Did it, it was hurt you the, on the, a shoot level. It did. Yeah. It did because it's a it's a it's a work. It's a, it's a work. But watch me on Povich. Watch me on Povich with Elijah. You know. Uh, uh, Kali- uh, I can't remember his exact name, but man, it was like 20 years ago, bro. Um, and all the kids that I did so much stuff with, it meant so much to them. And they didn't get it. They didn't get that, you know, the best wrestlers are the ones that make the turn from baby to heel and back and can fool people and can take them along with that ride and sell merchandise the entire way and be successful the entire way and be able to make that transition and carry people because they care about who you are, whether the, you know, because to, to get people a successful, whether it be wrestling mats or, or fight is to get people to invest in who you are, whether they want you to win or lose. If they don't give a shit, then who give you, you fucking lost. Right? Agreed. Period. End of story. Uh, Floyd Mayweather. I can't stand him. But, man, he draws more money than rain. There you go. So, uh, Conor McGregor. You know, I, I have the same thought process on that one. But uh, um, the heel run, you know, the, the, I didn't want to do it to begin with because of the kid thing. I did so much with Make-A-Wish. I did... I did a lot of stuff, man, to where I knew it would crush these kids' hearts. Ironically, the night that I turned heel, I had a, a Make-A-Wish girl that had cancer. Okay? So what's the night that I turned heel? What did I do? Do you remember? No. I wrestled Hacksaw. What did Hacksaw come back from? Cancer. Thank you very much. So what effect do you think I had on that little girl when I came into that locker room? Whether it was a shoot or whether it was a work or whether I was getting paid millions of dollars, I still got a heart, you know, a big heart. And fuck everybody who can't see beyond, you know, the things that they read because I I really don't care about those people. But I I really am a very caring person, and that tore me apart. So I remember we were in Baltimore the next night, and I told the guys, I said, I'm done. After Baltimore, I'm going back, dude. It ain't working. It ain't happening. I know it would be badass. I would have been one of the fucking most ruthless some bitch fucking heels ever on the planet. I would have been you at 300 pounds, you know? And I swear that it, it like Brock and his decision to go back to the UFC, it'll haunt me, you know, from now until the day I die that I didn't fucking turn heel and, and give the fans the ability to see that part of me. Because, man, there's that wild animal in me that wants to just completely break loose and be uh, lawless. But the personal side of who you are. I couldn't do you it. You couldn't go there. I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't so do it. So how much control did you have in that decision? Was Eric running the show at the time? Yeah, but I had, I, I had obviously had, com- I mean, I don't remember, and I'm not looking back and saying, yeah, man, I was a fucking man, and I obviously had all the control. Well, I obviously had control enough to say no because I went back. Immediately to be in babyface. And man, speaking of control, I was trying to talk about cars, but we keep talking about wrestling, and I want to talk about your entrance. But when you talk about control, it jars my mind of Hulk Hogan, who always had creative control. One of the smartest guys in the business. People always knock me that I don't give the guy enough credit. <laughs> got a ton of respect for Hulk Hogan's career in the ring. So, sadly, that, that just seems to be what's true. There's no heat between myself and Hogan. I'm asking you, what was your relationship with Hulk Hogan when you were down there in WCW? All of a sudden, you shoot through the goddamn roof, hotter than a firecracker. Y'all do some business. What's the relationship? What's the dynamic? Well, he's Hulk Hogan. He's going to do his thing, right? I'm the guy coming in. I'm, his, I'm, a, I'm a worthy nemesis that's going to make everybody a lot of money, which fortunately ultimately makes the company and everyone else who falls under that umbrella a lot of money. But, uh, you know, I mean, hey, Hogan held me out a lot because uh, through osmosis and that it was not what he told me, it's what he did and I watched. Um, Less is more is the biggest thing that I learned from Hogan, period, end of story. Less is more. Throw out every bit of the rest. My relationship with him was was superficial in that I was the guy and I was money in that you know uh, but I I like Hogan man I mean he done he's he's there's something about those Florida guys man he knobs and all those goofs man I there's something wrong with him there's something that they got going with this 
I don't get it. But, you know, it, I, I, I like Hogan. If it wasn't for guys like him to pave the way for guys like me and you, it's like Don Fry paving the way for, you know, Chris Weedman. You know, uh, uh, it's – it's uh, he, whether it be the wrestling business or the movie business, I mean, he's done things and broken barriers that uh, I'm very appreciative of. But, I mean, he's part of the business. He's, he's, and when you mention Hulk Hogan, and when I say he's part of the business, I do nothing but smile and giggle. Dude, you brought the name Chris Weedman. Man, he had to uh, bow out of a title fight trying to get his belt back from Luke Rockhold, who dethroned him several months back. Michael Bisping gets put in the picture. You watch UFC 199 just like I did. All of a sudden, the bell rings. I thought Luke Rockhold looked a little bit overconfident, lackadaisical, in my opinion. And I say this with, with all respect to Luke Rockhold, who I met many months ago when I was interviewing uh, Daniel Cormier down there in uh, San, San Jose where they train. My point is, what were your thoughts on that fight? Because a lot of people thought, you know, best being coming in on two weeks' notice didn't have a chance. I've always maintained that while Bisping may not be heavy-handed, he does have power in his hands. A lot of people consider him more of a volume guy. I, I didn't see him win in this fight. He's got the bad eye. He comes in there, fights a smart fight. I thought maybe Luke Rock. I thought maybe Luke Rockhold took him too lightly, and boom, two shots. We've got a new champion. What were your thoughts on that fight? What he's got brought to the octagon? What I bring the the thing that I bring from it is that Bisping walked through. Rockhold's offense, his attempted offense, was precise and coming two weeks off of having a fight. So he's still on, or however many weeks it was since his last fight. He's he's still in shape to fight. And technically, he's a very good boxer. At the end of the day, man, it's a chess match. And uh, these guys who do MMA, they're all nuts. And it's styles make fights, period, end of story. So one time when you think you look at a guy's record and he has no shot whatsoever of fucking beating another dude, I mean, it's completely dependent upon the style. And, and, and obviously the matchmaker who wants the guy. I mean, you know, it's the same thing. Right, right. I, 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 I know what you're saying. Yeah. But then, dude, anytime you get into an octagon, and this is just me as a super fan, when they close that, that door, Anybody's got a chance, no matter you know, if you're ranked number one or you're the pretty, champion. Pretty fighting. much. I mean, pretty you, much. You have you're a right. puncher's chance yeah. if you connect. And, and I, I'm, not, I'm not knocking Michael Bisping. I'm just saying, I think he came in what he was, what he, maybe he was ranked seven or eight. I can't remember. But, I mean, that's a guy that when he first well, came Well, look at in, Holly Holm. Yeah. You know, my brother was in Vegas and said, hey, man, does she have a chance? And I'm like, I, I didn't know shit from Shino as far as, like, Making a making a a good decision, telling my brother when he's got money on the line, um, and I said, I mean, I really don't know, but I don't I don't think she's got a shot. Well, I didn't know a lot about Holly. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know how mentally she was going to prepare and how or how decorated she was from her boxing career. I knew she was decorated, but not to the extent that she was. And so she's been in wars before. And Styles make fights. Period. End right. of story. You know. Again. So, and I met Holly, and she's awesome. And I guess, yeah, she seems like a class. I, I'm terrible. looking forward to seeing what happens because, obviously, coming up in 200, it's going to be the champ, Misha Tate. Here's the thing. Misha Tate's only 29 years old. She's been around forever. So she's stayed, you know, nose to the grindstone. She works her ass off. Finally was able to get that gold after being defeated twice by Ronda Rousey. R Rousey hands a defeat at Holly Holm. See where what she comes back with. Uh, so I think uh, Misha fights Nunez at um, – uh, Pardon me if I'm getting the name wrong, uh, at, at 200, then to see what comes out of that, whether Rousey will jump back in the title picture. Do you see that happening? Who knows, man? You know you know as well as I do uh, that we have to make uh, good business decisions behind the scenes. And so I don't know what her motive is as far as her next fight, whether she wants to ride off into the, into the sunset MMA-wise and just go into Hollywood. She's the girlfriend of a good buddy of mine, man. It's funny, man. It's just funny how things are so close to home and so you, there's such you, big deals, yeah. you know, out on the on the I in just the, in the atmosphere. And then you know, I'm 
hanging out with Gage at one of his baseball tournaments, and there's Travis with his nephew or something. And, uh, man, I've known Travis since he tells me the story about going to my brother's restaurant, Pacific Coast Grill, when I was wrestling. And he was a little, he was a little, he was never little. He says he was a kid in the corner, and he was too scared to come over and ask for my autograph. <laughs> and he's telling me this as his two kids are running around the parking lot, and he's looking down at me, and I'm going, fucking hey, man, I'm old. You know, so. All right, let me shift back to uh, for a little bit of professional wrestling. That's enough MMA out of me. I'm a, uh, I'm just an MMA fan. Don't know the total technicality of the sport, but I have my thoughts and opinions. I got to ask you, man. We're, we're we're here. We're supposed to be talking about cars, but dude, I got to ask you about your fucking entrance. You had one of the best entrances in the history of the business, in my opinion. That fucking music they drummed up for you, it, it, was the, it was the right music for the right guy at the right time, with the right atmosphere, the right attitude. And how did this thing become what it was? And because when you look at the great entrances, like Undertaker, one of the best of all time, uh, Triple H had a, a really good entrance at WrestleMania a couple of years ago uh, when uh, Motorhead was out there playing for him. Lemmy kicked it off, and goddamn, it was awesome. I had that glass break, and it was what it was, but it was simplified. Here you are, the biggest, baddest, most jacked-up motherfucker in the building, and depending on where you guys were at or how you were staffed, <laughs> cops, cops had anywhere from six to 20 security guards walking your ass they were, to the they ring. They were keeping everybody safe with me walking in the ring. You know, here's the I like deal. I like that spin. The cool, the, the cool thing is, and this is no bullshit, man. I mean, and I've said it a million times, is that it was all organic. I remember sitting. We were training. One time I was with Sting in, in the in the trailer right uh inside of the building and it was like the music vault okay and we were scanning through music and we picked <laughs> we picked fucking invasion dude that was it that's none of the shit was planned out none of the like the like the the street that was none of the shit was planned out it was just like it happened and they just kind of went with it honest to god you know, I'm gonna, I mean, I've said it before, but you know how I came up with who's next? This is even funnier. <laughs> <Ow>. <laughs> I'm in San Bernardino, and it was uh, we were doing TV tapings. And this is before anything, right? I think it was dark. It was just for me to train, kind of like down in Orlando at Universal Studios. And uh, I can't remember the name of the restaurant, so I, I, I won't get in any legal trouble. So I'm sitting down with the, one of the producers of the Love Boat and my brother Steve, and we're about to order, and the producer looks at me and he says, you know, you have to have a gimmick. You have to have a saying. You have to have a slogan. You've got to get people behind you. And uh, I said, you know what? You're right. <laughs> you know where I'm going, don't you? This epiphany. Yeah. So the waitress comes up, and she looks, and she goes, who's next? And that was it. I swear to God, I looked at them and I went, that's it. Who's next? Because after I beat the first guy, it's open fucking season. So it's perfect. It's plain. It's simple. It's straight to the point. It's not. I don't like to be wordy. You know, it gives too many. It gives too many options to people to tear you down. Yeah. That's how Who's Next was born. That's awesome. Swear, God, I'll pinky promise you. <laughs> Dude, whose idea was it for all the security guards to keep everybody safe from Bill Goldberg? It might have been Dillinger's idea. It was a great idea. I mean, Doug going into business for himself. And I remember Doug, and I know he's not listening to the podcast, but Doug, you were always good to me back down in the WCW Center Stage guys, Center Stage days. So thank you very much for everything you did hey, for me. It was me. awesome, man. I love Doug to death. But I don't remember whose idea it was. I know Shivani had a lot to do with... You know, with the streak itself, and you know, I I know Heenan had a lot to do with. I mean, I don't. It was all what was Heenan's it was thoughts all on you? organic. I don't Talk, know. I can't, man. I no, can't ask you. No, did he help you? Because you know, Ever, Heenan was brilliant. Yeah, all the yeah, boys he loved helped Heenan. me. He helped Versatile. me tremendously. Yeah, he was. He was so funny, so smart, so such a worker. Could buy. I mean, he could work better than half the boys. He was just a, he, he was like a, a utility player, but he whatever he did, he was A+. Plus. I loved him. I loved him, not only because 
it gave me the opportunity to rub shoulders and learn from a guy that I'd watched on television, you know, and thought was really cool and really talented and it would, had me emo- emotionally invested, who was a guy who, you know, inherently wasn't the biggest wrestling fan. Um, it was an honor, a privilege, and he was fucking hilarious. I'm sitting here in Goldberg's garage. We're going to come back because I'm I need legi- to take a break because I, I legitimately to- have to take a break too, and I'm going to leave it at that, and we're going to talk about cars. Hey, did you get this? Uh, there's a welding helmet or a burning helmet. What kind of helmet is this, uh, Bill? Because it's, it's a welder, dark glass. It's a welder, man. It's a welder. For Where's the dark glass at? I, um, Did Gage, you get that from Jesse? When Gage we popped it out. No, Jesse and I aren't the best of friends anymore. Oh, either. dude, what happened? Um, that's a whole other podcast. Too, okay, but. we're coming right back after a break. Apostles Cause, uh, sponsors to keep the show on here for free twice a week. I'm hanging with I Bill Goldberg. I don't miss saying that. Shit's getting bad. <laughs> You're listening to another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Support for this podcast comes from Pluto TV. Need an escape? Drop in to Pluto TV for a world of free TV. Stream hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and shows all for free. Yeah, free. No subscriptions, no fees. Imagine 24-7 channels of Narcos, CSI, Star Trek, Survivor, and everything else from hit movies to binge-worthy TV shows, the latest news, live sports, comedy, and more. What are you waiting for? Download the free Pluto TV app for Android, iPhone, Roku, and Fire TV, and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. Man, I just took a hell of a beer break with Bill Goldberg here at Goldberg's Garage. I thought I was going to talk about cars, and we will at some point. You took a dump. That wasn't a beer break. <laughs> Start up the hair dryer. I got to ask you about a particular poster you have right over there. It's Adam Sandler's Longest Yard. You and I had the spot in this illustrious movie, did good business at the box office. And what was your character's name? Because uh, I don't even know mine. So we battle. <laughs> <laughs> did, you have, did you have any creative control over the name of your character? Because knowing you with your fucking no, but I, I did, did. I did. I did request the X. <laughs> I did have not have any creative control over anything. The penis thing with the jock strap at the end was a payback for him not putting me in the first couple Hanukkah songs. Um, you know, no, no creative control except for stiffening a couple guys with elbows with wearing pads and the X. That was it. Here's the deal. It was you, me, uh, Brian Bosworth, Michael Irvin. Uh, I don't know what Dilip's saying, but we were all in the same spot. You and I all got the same dough, which will go unmentioned. Yeah. And so we all had that spot. How did you – did you have to go audition? Because I did. And, and my part, I was a guard at the prison, and I was a running back. And here's the thing, dude. I thought I was going to be like a lineman or something. The time we did that movie, I was in pretty good shape. I was 275. And I was a pretty good 275, and I was drinking like a fish. It's Kevin and Nash and I – Kevin Nash and I would stay up at the little lounge there. I got a great story. People were a, stupefied at the kind of alcohol that we were consuming. And then we were out of there. Tell you heat. how stupefied they were. I, 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 you know, first of all, it's another subject, but you must tell everybody who the only actor was that did every freaking football scene. Um, it was me, other than a couple – Dude, I Couple did every kickoffs. football scene there was. Ooh. When we had to run through all those pads and, and all, all the no, dummies. Oh, man, the hits and everything. Oh, I didn't have to do the hits, but I was running I'm talking the... about the hits in the God movie. God damn it, Bill. I pulled okay. a hamstring, I know. I, I'm not going to go I there. Can't. I was not. I was, dude, I was going to glaze over that, bro. We, 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 but no, that's, we, like a, that's like a football player going in the wrestling ring and not knowing what it's like. That you were a wrestler that went into a football well, well, arena. Here's the thing, Bill. And you, here's you, know, the thing, you weren't not, ready for Here's it. the thing, Bill. I wasn't You're not conditioned as, for Listen it. to me. I wasn't, a good, I wasn't as good a football player as you. I didn't ascend. I didn't get a major college 
scholarship to Georgia University. wasn't widely recruited by many colleges. Uh, You're condescending colleges. in your in your explanation. No, no, no. You was a bad motherfucker, <laughs> and, and you played some pro football. I was good enough to get a scholarship at a Division two school. Football. My football. point is, I played football. I was aggressive. But you weren't ready for the football oh, conditioning. No, That's dude. what I'm saying. I've been in a wrestling and so, ring. so watching look, you look, go look. through that, you and Nash. See them? that wall over there? It's 20, it's 20 feet away. Uh-huh. I was used to running to a 20-foot rope and ricocheting off of it and coming back. Well, All of a sudden, I'm on a football field, All I can and we're say running 100 yards. We were playing. We were, we, I was playing football. Then I jumped into your arena. Then we got to do the longest yard. Then we could go kind of go back to my arena so i could back up and watch you guys and kind of giggle a little bit that's all dude to see my fucking crippled ass try to run through those pads i was a running back and i was running back in high school but i just thought i was gonna be i thought dude here's the thing i always thought you know they're gonna have a stunt guy for my shit yeah that was my they they had to at the end now back in the old days well you know when i was doing movies and shit that i had a stunt man do some of my shit and i always did most of my shit because on the budget that we were on Anyway, I pulled a hamstring. We was out there in the fucking heat of Santa Fe, and then over there at uh, El Camino Junior College, mm-hmm. whatever, in Los Angeles. Did they call you? Did they say, hey, we want Bill Goldberg to play this part? How did you get that part? Because I think Barry was representing me at the same Barry's time. The, Barry's you. the one who got the leap to do it. You yeah. Because in the meeting that I had with them, I think it was the three of the producers. Adam wasn't in the meeting. But in the meeting that I had with them, he brought up the leap. I remember that. That was the mo- most memorable thing about the entire meeting. That and the fact that I told them that I needed a week off for Sturgis. And, excuse me, which leads me to the story reverting back to you and Kevin Nash's exploits. Because the week that I – but uh, I, so my wife and I go to Sturgis uh, – and um, we come back, and it was uh, it was like four o'clock in the morning, and I remember we walked, <laughs> we're walking through the lobby, and the adjacent to the lobby is the bar, and on the bar are two gentlemen that look quite familiar. They were both passed out, and one was named Kevin Nash, and the other was what was his name? Could have, could have been a dude that looked like me. <laughs> he looked just like you, but he wasn't me, and. Uh, that was that was classic. That was one of the things I bet that remember me driving to set on that motorcycle with a mullet with that yet yeah, with that uh, with that uh, blonde wig on. <laughs> You you had some interesting moments in the filming process. You had a couple of meltdowns. What was going on with you? I don't know what happened that one time. That one dude who was your double man. Was being a dingleberry at the breakfast at the at the Denny's or something, and I wanted to eat him or something. I can't remember. Other than that, that was it, wasn't it? I can't remember. I just remember it was like four or five minutes <laughs> out of my life, and dude, we were on like the no punny. We were on like the no money scale because the, the well, amount I mean, was it, you know the amount it was, of money uh, was it good. was us going. Put it this way, dude. At the end of the day. It was us taking one for the team, but being a part of that team, you know, we 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 can't shake that the rest of our lives because that was a cool experience. Oh, it was a great experience. And here's the thing, dude, I met a lot of guys living in Los Angeles, and I don't hang around nobody. You're a hermit out here in this wonderful compound. I'm a hermit in my little compound there on Gimmick Street in Marina Del Rey. But out of all the folks I met, and, and you, I think you can back me on this, and if you've got someone cooler – than Adam Sandler, just throw out a name because that gotta, dude was fucking cool. Well, remember what Bert did for us. Remember Bert, you know, dude. flying us to. Here's know, the thing: when I, I got a chance to go, he's talking about Bert Reynolds. Mm-hmm. I got a chance. I knew Bert wasn't feeling that great, you know, during the filming of that movie, but he was such a goddamn uh, movie star, superstar back in the day. Of course, Deliverance, all the smoke in the Bandit movies, uh, everything that Bert did, I watched. So I, well, yeah, I, I introduced myself. I got to two. Him. I got two Trans Ams. He didn't know who the fuck I was. He, well, but dude he, was, the, only, he, the only reason he knew who I was is because of my wife. Really, really, because she'd been in movies with him before me. Ah, but it was a good dude. But he's, Sandler he's was awesome good. Man. Well, I mean, you know, we all got stories about Sandler. I mean, you were, you know, obviously 
um, had softer lips than I did, and so you've been Dude, doing, you've done you? more, you've done more movies than, with him than I have. You? But no, he was great. Are you kidding me? He put me in the Hanukkah thing. He put me in the Longest Yard. But you know, the coolest thing I got about Adam is that when Gage was born, my son, you know, ten years ago, um, he had uh, a, a fever, and so we, they had to keep him overnight with Wanda. And there was a kid across the hall that had uh, botulism. You know the the gimmick that you know would eat your skin and it was just the worst thing you could ever see man the kid was like 10 and he he recognized me and you know it turns out that his favorite guy was adam sadler so i called adam and not only did adam get on the phone with the kid but adam drove down there and saw him that's cool so i mean i'm not gonna go you don't need to go any further than that Dude, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on the topic of movies are you fixing to film any more movies i've got a tap yeah out. man september uh Sometime in uh, August, I got to go into pre-production since I'm co-executive producing this damn thing. And um, where y'all shooting at? We're shooting in uh, New Orleans, man. God Orleans. damn! God bless your heart, because I thought she was going to say like Budapest. No, uh, no, that I, ain't happening. These movies aren't expensive. Croatia, well, which well, we did. The people, my, this podcast is worldwide. I got people from Budapest, Croatia, listening to this podcast. But I've been pitched a couple of movies that have been shot way over there. In Me too. And, and you, know I say, what? you know what? Yeah. There's a lot of places I'm going to be, but a long ways from home is not where I'm going to be. No, it's about that uh, that that uh, claustrophobic no, uh, n- no ability to control your surroundings thing. Being a tube with wings, it's called an airplane. That, you don't dig it. So, well, you know, so I'm tell me about to, the movie. Hey, dude. Well, first of all, let's talk about a tube with with uh, wings. I'm going to London, and I'm doing one of the coolest things that at, that up. It ranks up with. Two other things with beating Hogan Me. in front of 45,000 people, meeting you, okay, and three. exposing the people that you don't drink all the beers that you that's say you drink. God damn it. Further you're emasculating you, like, like being the only guy in the world that's bad enough. Okay, what are you do doing? That's Drop it. Um, I'm going to Europe and I'm driving Mike Skinner's backup truck in the Goodwood Festival of Speed. It's the coolest fucking thing that I've ever done in a car or vehicle. Um, it, it you know two hundred thousand people will be there. It's all live on ESPN, but I get to drive a Craftsman truck, Mike Skinner's backup truck, you know where like Fittipaldi drives, like Iar Senna's driven, all the guys who have won championships throughout the years who are alive are asked to drive certain manufacturer cars or or the actual cars that they've won. You know, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, up until, you know, even today, man. It's Jaguar, you know, uh, uh, asked me to drive a car up the hill, man. It, it, it's going to be just absolutely cool. So I got to throw a shout out to Mike Skinner and Camus. Camus is our major sponsor. Yes, they're going with us. We're, we're going to have some fun. Are you talking drinking. about Camus Vineyards? Yeah, absolutely. Bill was Chuck, me. Chuck, uh, thank you very much, man. I can't wait. Uh, you better be li- listening to this podcast. Hey, dude, I can't I wait to drink some special reserve. I don't know how many bottles myself and Kevin Nash killed of Camus during the film in the Longest Yard, going back to that. Oh, yeah, I remember. And then uh, a couple of times when my, me and my illustrious wife went to Napa Valley, stopped by the Camus Vineyard uh, and had a good time there. But, dude, when you're talking about uh, – are you talking about open-wheel stuff? You're talking about indie style cars? No, I'm t- – well, the, every – go on YouTube. The only way you're going to do it justice, I can't describe it. Go on YouTube and, and Google Goodwood Festival of Speed. Okay. They have every single type of race car that races from the 20s, the, the teens, till now racing up this hill. It's an exhibition they have a NASCAR uh, exhibition group. You know, they have current NASCAR guys. They have Mike Skinner, who's driving the truck up it. Me, who's driving the truck. I'm a celebrity, quote unquote, driving up it. Ken Block drives up it. Every freaking European champion, every champion can, you know, every single person, all the rally cars, the big giant diesel freaking. Uh, Eighteen wheelers drive this thing. It's the coolest thing you could ever. Dude, ever do. Is, is Ken Block the dude that drives that Jim Connor car? Absolutely, he's, dude. He's that bad. motherfucker's insane. You know him? Yeah, yeah. He's a good dude. I used to do some stuff with Ford when that lawman, that car downstairs that we can't talk we're, about until we're standing next we're, to it. We're going to talk to him in a minute. Um, he, dude, how do you learn how to drive like that? I know you can drive, but that's what I'm Well, whole like level. my wife's a stunt woman, and, the, you know, the way that they used to do it is like every stunt guy back in the day is they used to go to 
an unknown an unnamed rental car company and take out <laughs> all the coverage and rent a Challenger or a Mustang or back in the day a Hertz 350 Mustang and beat the dog shit out of it and not be liable for anything because you took out the $20 full coverage. It's true. It's true. That's how she, if you had her on here, that she'd tell you that's how she learned how to drive as a stunt woman. Me, I mean, I've been afforded the opportunity to do schools throughout the years and, you know, race with Dodge at Bondurant in, in Atlanta, wherever. God damn it, dude. I'm glad you said that. I, it's on my bucket list. I was talking about this the other day. I'm fixing to go to a, a neon bending uh, class because I just love neon clocks. But uh, one of the things on my bucket list is long-range shooting, but you just brought it up. And w- whether it's any high-performance school, I'm not singling it out, but because I know of the name Bondurant, I want to go to a high-performance school. I'll get you school. hooked up at Bondurant. Those, those, I was going to do like the, the 392 Chrysler class, just a street performance, and then I want to get to the advanced level stuff. Now, what you would, what, what I want to do. If you, go, if you go to Goldberg95 on Instagram, there's my plug because... Goldberg 95 Instagram. That's what I do. You'll see the pictures of myself with the Bondurants. And uh, I was fortunate enough a couple weeks ago to be invited by Dodge to go down and do the Hellcat experience. The Hellcat experience is the same experience that every Hellcat buyer gets. They go to Bondurant and they learn how to go through the skid pad. They learn how to go on the track, the the autocross, the the braking, uh, and the road course. And, you know, I mean, I'm a speed junkie, and so I spent all my time in the Viper, the full-out race car, you know, going balls out, man, because that's what I like to do. But um, it was an awesome experience. Awesome. Uh, so, extent- Bondurant, you got to go. I'll get you hooked how up. There's great people there. How extensive is the class? I mean, is it totally immersive? You they have some- all different levels, all different levels from beginners. Dude, I- I'm going full bore. I, I want to do it all. <laughs> Dude, they've got stuff that puts me way above my comfort level, and I've been doing this stuff for years. I'm by no means a race car driver, but I'd like to think that, you know, and a car is an extension of myself in certain ways, and you can make it do what you want to do. You know, um, I've driven a number of races, and, I mean, they, they believe me, there's some things there that, that get me on the edge of my seat. And uh, so they'll take care of great care of you. You know, they'll they'll uh, hook you up on the podcast. You mentioned their name once or twice, like I just did, Bond Around School. And um, I'm telling you, Justin Bell, one of the IndyCar drivers, champions, is one of the instructors down there. I'm telling you, he, he'll be at Goodwood racing with me. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Corolla's racing. Corolla, at Goodwood. yeah. Dude, when Obviously, you go- Leno's racing there. Every, right. you know. uh, we're going to bring up Leno's name here uh, pretty quick. Going back to Corolla, I've been to uh, his podcast studio a couple of times. I mean, you know, the big car guy, as you know, and you he have. his garage. Yeah, he's got a lot of Paul, shit, I guess all of Paul Newman's old race cars. That's what he's driving at Goodwood. Oh, that's awesome. One of his race cars, yeah. Uh, you brought up a name earlier, fell out of favor with. I used to think that, that you and uh, Jesse James were good friends, and I brought this up not to rub you the wrong way we can drop it if you want to but i knew that jesse would go out there and he started running baja uh running gps with his with his driver uh, saw a couple of his trucks that he built he used to have a trans sam over in long beach before he moved over to uh, austin texas and the back of that uh trans am said some bitch on it <laughs> and i said god damn if there was ever a name for a car and it fit that car and i guess it was probably uh, he had a lot of money put in. I think Coors Light ended up buying that car, as a matter of fact. I could be wrong. But what happened with you guys? Because I thought you guys were much. You know, Jesse and I, were, you know, at the end of the day, man, life's too short. And uh, I, I'm I'm all good with Jesse. But, you know, it was just a misunderstanding. At the end of the day, we like to make everybody out there in the fairy, you know, in, in, Wonder, in uh, Never Neverland think that uh, everything's peaches and cream all the time and that we have, we're hands-on with everything. But... It was an article that uh, somebody uh, interviewed me for, and I had mentioned that some other guy at his shop did the majority of the work on the black bike right over there. Right. And Jesse, and then I let them use the bike to go to Sturgis to be in their display. And Jesse called me and had a wrinkle in his underwear about it that I didn't give him all the credit. And I'll never forget, man. I had, I think Fry was over here. 
a couple other guys were over here and I came down and I was talking to him on the phone and I was yelling and screaming and I was like, my head was going to explode and they didn't know what the hell was going on. And I was, you know, I took offense to it cause I was at the guy's wedding, man, you know? And at the end of the day, it was, uh, I completely understood why he was pissed off about it because, you know, I made it sound like he didn't do the bike, but um, hey, man, Jesse was getting really big at the time, and he wasn't at the shop all the time. So every time I was there, he wasn't there. Yeah, and, you know, on the other side of that, here, here's my chopper story. Uh, Bill is a huge into motorcycles, anything speed-related, his car collection. Man, I've been a car guy all my life. I just haven't bought a whole bunch of them. But I'll, I'll never forget, uh, there was four guys in WWF who was going to get choppers, and one of the guys dropped out. So the big show calls me and says, hey, dude, uh, so-and-so dropped out. We was going to get four choppers built by West Coast Choppers. They're giving us a pretty good deal on them. You want to get a chopper? And I'm thinking, yeah, for the money. I mean, it's still a lot of money, but I said, yeah, I mean, why not? I didn't need a chopper. You know, I, I like to look at choppers. Don't really want to ride a chopper. It's a good PR move. It's a good PR move, and it'd be cool to get in because we're getting a little bit of a break. So, okay. So anyway. I go down to West Coast Shoppers in Long Beach, talk to dudes. Hey, man, yeah, here's kind of what I'm thinking. The bill, the bill process starts. Literally, and I could be exaggerating a little bit, I just uh, moved to Malibu. Dude, don't ever move to Malibu. It's highly overrated. Don't With worry. all due respect to all the people that live there, it wasn't my cup of tea, but that's where I was living. About two and a half years later, here comes a delivery truck to bring in my West Coast Chopper to me. And this motherfucker was immaculate. It was badass. Metal flake, you know, red flames off a red tank skull right there where the gas cap is. Uh, no speedometer. The brake light was about the size of my thumbnail. And, you know, that fork seemed about six foot long. It was loud and it was powerful. So they dropped it off. They rode off in the sunset. And uh, I get on my damn chopper. Kick that thing over or started. I can't remember what the deal was. We're, we're mobile now. And I got on the Pacific Coast Highway, and I rode about three miles just going through the gears, <laughs> loud as fuck. The bike was an absolute monster. I turned it around in one gigantic U-turn because the forks were so long. I came back. My wife was sitting there waiting for me in the garage in Malibu. As I come up the hill and came into the garage, she goes, well, how was it? I said, it was awesome. It's for sale. <laughs> she, she said, "Was it a rigid?" She, uh, no, it, it had some. It was a rigid because there weren't no shocks in the back. Yeah. And so, basically, with those long forks, it doesn't really absorb anything. Bill is unmasking uh, a badass black bike right so now. So basically, it was it was kind of like this. It's exactly like yours. It was rigid. And so, and so, it, you can only imagine with the guy's birthday at December twenty seventh uh, of this year when I will turn the uh, ripe old age of fifty. That with this rigid and the monstrous rear tire that you see, that this is a spine buster. So this is currently up for sale. Um, just because I, you know, I'm a I'm a, a firm believer that uh, someone else needs to ride the beautiful piece of machinery because I I ain't getting on it again. Bill, my bike looked very similar in structure to this. The same pipes. Mine, mine were chrome. Yours are blacked out. Yeah. Uh, but basically the same layout, the, the, the skulls on the center of the tank. My, my gas cap was a little bit further back, flames, and it, it was supreme. So shout out to West Coast Shoppers. And here's the deal. Well, my wife said, how was it? Let me finish the story first. And I said, it was awesome. I said, it's for sale. And she goes, what are you talking about? It took two and a half years to get this bike. I said, Kristen, I said, there's going to be a lot of things that happened to me. Uh, but one of the things that's not going to happen to me is getting smoked on the PCH by a car riding a West Coast chopper. Yeah. I, I wish I would belt, you know, just like a, just like a Springer or just something, yeah. you know, just like a regular bike okay. with regular shocks. Okay, you see that uh, road glide over there? Right. That road glide's only been on uh, the 15. It's I don't think it's it's been on the five maybe two times. I've had this house for 18 years. I won't ride on the highway with these motorcycles. That bike right there, that's for sale. This bike right there, that's for sale. That one right there is the Gold, original Goldberg bike from West Coast Chopper, so that's never for sale. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's my wife's bike downstairs. It's for sale. I, uh, my time now is predicated upon spending as much of it as with my family as possible. I can't put Gage on the back of that, so I can put him in that. 
and I can put them in that, and I can surely put them in that. So why not get rid of these when I don't have the time to get on them and enjoy them? And when I do, they're just going to shove my spine up and through, you know, up through, you know, the back of my head. Uh, it's not enjoyable anymore. And let somebody else have fun with them. They're badass. There's no doubt about it. This thing's got 160 horsepower. It's got more horsepower than those Prius things that I was but talking about. But what about, I, I don't know how you are, Bill. It's just like, man, I, I'm a brand ambassador for Kawasaki Motorsports. Just the, the Mule Pro FXT line. I got a KLX 450 that I had brand new in 2008. I still got it. That bike probably doesn't have three hours on it. But And, and I didn't need a 450 because I ain't got the skill to control that thing. But they say with age comes the cage. Do you feel that oh, just yeah. from a from from a safety no standpoint? And dude, Why I live. You, we, we 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 both live in California. A lot of lane splitting going on here, and safe rides for anybody who's on two wheels. Lane but splitting. Man, that's bullshit. You know, know these people who split lanes. First of all, uh, uh, under twenty five miles an hour. It's or was it under twenty? It's it's. Uh, you can do it under, but you can't do it over. That's it's against the law, correct? Well, I didn't I didn't know that because everything that comes by me is screaming. Well, I'm telling you, man, these guys who do that, you know, put take their life and their their lives in their hands, and they may they make it bad for guys like me who just want to go out and leisurely hang out on their bike. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that they do it, man. But well, I think you know, and, and that's you know, they're they're taking whatever risk they're they're taking. Cause I don't but want to what they're doing is they're putting other riders. other people's lives in danger too. Because if a seventy-five year old lady looks over and sees a motorcycle like two inches away from her window, she might freak out. But dudes, my bike. You got that little gimmick mirror on your left hand of your uh, steering handlebar. I had so. the same bullet gimmicks on my uh, handlebar holders. I bet the uh, the brake light is, is you know about as big as your thumbnail. And they make badass bikes. And and, and, and and let me say this: in in I, mean, I don't want to say in defense of uh, Jesse James, but I think you will agree. Like you said, he was blowing up at the time. Did he yeah. hand build every single motorcycle that came out of there? No, no. but did, but did they ask me if he built it? Then I, you know, you well, know, yeah. If I, I ask you that lot. question, that's a whole different thing. That's what they said. But in, a, in an assembly line, yeah, he can't touch every single thing. Comes he out don't there. have, but he never had an assembly line. You know that. And he, 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 at, in the beginning, he had hands on on everything. But obviously, once you get bigger and 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 more productive, then you can't have hands on every single motorcycle. But you know, when somebody well, asks me, a, when somebody asks me a question, then I'm going to give hmm, the answer. And Bill Dodge is the guy who mo mainly built the bike that in question. That's the guy that built mine. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. A, I'm in a Goldberg garage. <laughs> I just validated, you know, my entire fucking argument. Well, I put in some time because this podcast. Yeah, yeah. There you. There you go. Do you want to talk about your cars, or do you want to go hang out and just do your thing? Dude, man, at the end of the day, it's an honor and a privilege to be in the same breath that you breathe. And so the umbilical cord we talk of, such as this microphone that bonds us together right now, we may talk as long as you'd like. All right, we're going to talk cars. I'm coming back. <laughs> Go Goldberg. Thank you. That was eloquent. Huh? This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. New to Podcast One Sportsnet, Michael Irvin and Ron Jaworski. The MIP. I am the MVP of the MIP. I am Michael Irvin, and I got a great show. It was a shock. It was a shock okay. to the system. <laughs> <laughs> I went to practice the next day. I made every tackle. No big deal. Any other coach out here, you lose, you will leave too. But let me tell you what I pulled out of last week. It made me say, oh, that's a playmaker right there. Y'all saw it. I'm the guy, right? <laughs> I'm the guy. I'm it's the guy. Real. Look out. Trouble is coming. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Eagles Hall of Fame quarterback Ron Jaworski, and I am so excited to bring you the hottest new podcast for the NFL and gaming. Welcome to Jaws Picks, featuring me, Ron Jaworski, as I give you my expert analysis and predictions of each and every NFL game. And you could hear the quarterbacks like it was a yeah, practice. Yeah. And, man, I was just loving 
here in the quarterbacks call everything at the line of scrimmage. You know, they've kind of solved some of their problems over the last couple weeks, man. They were getting gutted on defense, but that's 53.3% correct against the spread. Download new episodes of the Michael Irvin Podcast every Thursday and Jaws Picks with Ron Jaworski every Wednesday and Friday on all your favorite podcasting platforms.